Yeah, for those of you who can't remember my last name, just call me Mr. AADL. I respond to that as well. By the way, my partner in crime in this whole thing is Bruce Lewis, who is in the audience. He is the chair of the ADL Standards Committee, and I've been the technical lead. And this September, we celebrated our 20th anniversary, so uh, we know what we are doing. At least we think we know what we are doing. <laughs> so um, my job is to introduce you to what AADL is all about, and then afterwards you hear from a whole bunch of people about some of the technologies that drive it, as well as people that use this technology. Uh, the one-page summary of it is, all of you know, today nothing works anymore without software, not even your fridge. Uh, obviously, your car is taken in more often for software upgrades than for mechanical repairs. Um, and what has been shown through studies is that 80% of the problems that you find in embedded software is found post-unit test. So that's where all your effort goes, and I'll show you more detailed numbers in a moment. And so the solution that we see happening is how can we avoid those problems delaying all the way to system integration? Can we catch those things early in the process? Because that's where there are, uh, many of them are introduced. And the approach we have taken is to say, can we have a modeling language that has semantics built in about embedded software systems? So it's not just boxes and arrows, but some of the semantics behind it, the timing, the fault behavior, and those kinds of things. And do it as a standard, because that then provides stability so that people are willing to invest in learning the technology and invest in tooling the technology. The second thing that makes it interesting is so uh, on the first part, we did pilots and pilot projects, and slowly people are uh, using it in, in, in various projects uh, for real products. We also developed a tool set that's an open source tool set on top of Eclipse that's for free. Part of the idea was to put this technology out and little, let people effectively, quote, play with it, as I call it. And so AADL has actually become a platform for research that if you look at the number of DARPA-funded uh, programs, a lot of people are doing their research on top of AADL, and what that allows them to do then is very quickly get access to real customers with real models of real systems to apply their technology. So that's kind of an interesting side effect we got out of our AADL technology. But overall, the, basically the goal was, can we reduce the leakage that's happening all the way to system integration and uh, do through early analytical assurance um, address the problem? Three examples to just illustrate the point about that. Uh, all three of them are at, out of the aerospace industry, but I can pull out, doesn't matter if it's automotive, medical, or like I said, refrigerators, <laughs> they all have the same problem. This was one from a while back, an Airbus, and in their report it says, this appears to be a unique event. Well, what does that tell you? They had no idea what was happening. <laughs> And what happened in reality is uh, because these things are time sensitive, there is, you just need some minor variation of timing. And if you don't deal with that problem correctly, you may be in state space and states that are, the system is totally out of sync with reality. And a second interesting one is, and I didn't want to bias towards Airbus, so I have a Boeing example. <laughs> And this one you may be familiar as well, where they found out that the 787 would lose quad redundancy in the power system, even in mid-flight, if the power system was on 247 days and I don't know how many hours and minutes. And so you ask yourself, why that number? Well, the number is interesting because they, represent, they used a default representation for an integer as a count of 16-bit integers where they were counting time. They used the default for time ticks out of the operating system, which was one of, out of 100 milliseconds. And if you take that, it is after that many days where the counter wraps around. And that's where you get then your problem. So you could argue, well, this is just a coding problem. Not necessarily, because if you think of requirements, what's the requirement behind the whole thing? We have an operational period of time that we expect the system to be up and running. That was never specified in the requirements documentation, so there was never an attempt to verify 
that you account to <laughs> manage the time span that they are supposed to account. And then the third example is the most recent one, um, the max. Uh, you guys are quite familiar with that. There's plenty of it in the news. I brought this example up because it starts out as a system engineering issue. The engine didn't fit under the wing of an aircraft that's 40 years old. So they then started kludging around and came up with a software solution. In the software system, they made their typical errors. But the point that I'm trying to make here, it's not just the software side that had problems, but also their safety risk assessment process. It's a very human intensive process if you follow it today. They made some engineering decisions late in the process, never revisited that. And you also have the situation where they offered airlines to buy the product with one sensor active or two sensors active, but would they be able to tell you that for the $100,000, how much risk reduction are you buying yourself? Okay, so just to see if we can help in that arena, I recently actually created an AADL model and I'm able to now generate risk numbers for the various scenarios, like for example, not informing the pilot about MCAS or later on when the memo came out, how much risk was really reduced because they still didn't tell them that the uh, discrepancy detector didn't work. And so I actually have a, a set of models that allow you to illustrate for every single engineering and management decision what the underlying risk is behind the whole thing. And that's what model-based engineering is all about, is that throughout your whole process, you can play those games, what I call games. <laughs> for other people, it's really knowledge that you need. So what we have is embedded software systems. They introduce a new class of problems that you didn't have in system, basic system engineering that traditional methods don't really address very well. Well, what do we have? Again, from real data, 70% of the problems are introduced during requirements and architectural design, and only 3.5% are caught in that phase. And then on the other hand, and the number we have already mentioned, 80% are caught post-unit test. And there is just a small number uh, introduced later on. And the cost for fixing, obviously, is much higher on the back end. So if you can bring those things forward, that's where we get this uh, high-level cost reduction. And then if you look at trend figures, and this is from the aircraft industry again, in 1997, the embedded software systems made up 45% of the total system development cost. By 2010, it was already up to 66%. And if you don't make changes to the process, it will be 88% by 2024. And so given today, we are spending 50% of our total system development cost on post unit test rework, okay? So great opportunity to improve the process. Okay, from a technical side, typical picture for system engineers, control engineers, you have a system under control and a control system and there's various mistakes that you can make. Operator errors, forgetting system hazards, uh, physical plant characteristics. And one example on that is uh, the um, uh, London Underground had an automated system for closing doors and uh, the driver was closing the door in the winter. One of the doors didn't close all the way, so he stepped out from the outside, closed the door, and the train took off without him <laughs> because they didn't have programmed in a special fault situation. Um, so they can make mis on the system engineering side, we can make mistakes. But as we add software, there's plenty more spaces where we can do it. Your control system algorithms get translated into software. This is where the Ariane or the, the counter example that I gave you, the size, measurement units, those kinds of things. The application software now runs concurrently, so you can have concurrency errors. And one example of it is actually iTunes, which um, crashed after dual core processors came out because it internally had two concurrent tasks on a single processor. They obviously were executed sequentially. And now all of a sudden you move to dual core, things run in parallel. How many pieces of software do you have that potentially can run concurrently and you don't manage that concurrently? The next one is you map your runtime system onto your hardware. This is where you now get virtualization and redundancy issues. And this is where um, the internet, DARPANET, in 1982, uh, New England was totally disconnected from the rest of the network, even though it three months earlier had five physical trunk lines going into New England. The problem was AT&T had introduced um, fiber optics 
and then they realized that the bandwidth was there so they could, they could move all five physical trunk lines as logical trunk lines onto the same cable. And somebody in New Jersey dug up the cable. Uh, so, <laughs> and then the last one is when you're doing your processing, you have data moving through, data is time sensitive, so you have plenty of places where uh, you can affect that amount of time it takes for the data to move from one end to the other. So what do we have now? Despite best system practices, and the airline, in, uh, the aircraft uh, industry has pretty strong processes, we still get all these mistakes. And the, again, the problem is there's things that are happening on the software side that we need to get our hands around, whether that's from a safety perspective or cybersecurity perspective. A lot of the underlying issues are the same. And what AADL has, as I mentioned, has semantics behind uh, the models so that we analytically can put our fingers on these issues. Okay, the standard itself. When we model the system, uh, and you think of software, some people say software and uh, software design, so that's your packages and all that kind of stuff. Now here we're talking about the runtime architecture of the system, which means from the software side, not just the functions, but the way the functions execute the task and communication architecture, the way it's mapped onto the underlying platform, and the way it interfaces with the physical system. Both the platform interfaces with the physical system and the application interfaces, because those are the problem areas that we have. And so the SAE standard addresses th that area, and it's set up to be able to use AADL not by just a single engineer, but uh, collaboratively across teams. Uh, we have support for that in there as well. There is a industry initiative that ran from 2007 through 2014-15 called Savvy System Architecture Virtual Integration. It was run by an industry initiative uh, by um, the Aerospace Vehicle Systems Institute, and they chose AADL over System L4, the work that they were trying to do, and that initiative involved Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, a whole bunch of suppliers, FAA, NASA, and Army War and was as well. Um, when you think standard, it's actually a standard suite. There's the core language, which deals already with the three parts and the execution semantics behind it. Original version came out in 2004, second version 2012, and we are in the middle of pushing out uh, version three. It's a strongly typed language. For those of you who may remember Ada, there's a close relationship to that and the benefits of strong typing. It's a language that has both textual and uh, graphical uh, notation. And it has semantics built in regarding the execution, as I mentioned, including notions of threads of sampling and queuing and all that good stuff. For version three, what we are doing is just strengthening in the areas where we got feedback from customers where they want improvement, primarily on managing configurations and things like that. And we are also unifying the type system. Regarding the extension parts, there's a bunch of them that are already standardized and some of them in progress. We have one that deals with fault modeling. Uh, we have had two versions out on that, and that is being used quite heavily. There is an annex regarding uh, A-Ring 653. We are keeping up with their new releases of the standard and show people how you can support that kind of work, and in uh, uh, several other ones as well, like, for example, how do you interface with data modeling, where your data model may be in a representation, uh, whether it's UML or um, um, whatever other data modeling, ASN.1, for example. So um, AADL itself, as a standard, was funded largely by Amerdeck, and that's my connection to Bruce Lewis. And we have been going on since September 1999 was our first meeting. We very quickly, as we had the standard out, were doing various pilot projects. I'm showing you here some of the ones that were done uh, in the context of the US and uh, what we did there is interesting. We used it for some new things, but we also used it on existing systems. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out. AADL isn't just good for starting a new program, a new system. You can use it actually as a diagnostic tool on existing systems, get a better understanding what is supposed to go on architecturally and then map back to reality. And then you can see where there are just some discrepancy on that front. Um, Savvy, I already mentioned, and we had lots of interaction with them and feedback from them. Um, later on, we then got involved with Alex <laughs> and those guys, similar kind of thing happening and that's feeding into um, future vertical lift. Um, 
we also have had activities in Europe. The European Space Agency and the Airbus and their consorts came to the committee in 2002. And the European Space Agency then had a major project started in 2004, 15 million euros funded by the EC with 27 partners where they used AADL to model and analyze two satellite reference architectures to verify them before you instantiate them and then later on actually create instances. And the last point I wanted to make on this slide is that we always interacted with other standards committees. I already mentioned 653. We interacted with OMG when they wanted to do MARTI for embedded systems and we are working with like the S18 group on the safety side of things and then interacting with other groups like for example under the medical device arena. That's where John Hatcliffe, one of the speakers later today is our main actor on that front. When you do AEDL, you have a model and what you have then is either semantics already built in or through additional information annotated. From that, we then generate the analytical models and then run the various analysis. So th the nice side effect of it is if you make a change, say for example, the encoding scheme, it automatically, as we regenerate these analytical models, those changes are reflected and you can then find out what all the side effects are. Quick slide on uh, the intricacies of how to deal with the problem space. I mentioned already this latency example. Some people did a study to show how you, when you change the scheduling algorithm, how that affects the stability of the control algorithms. And while the list is actually much longer, so here are various contributors to your latency. Decisions that you make in the architecture, do you ever think about the side effect of that on the stability of the control algorithm that runs with you? Those are the kinds of things that we actually can through our analysis tools uh, uh, determine whether that's the case or not. And you see the list is pretty long here. And then can you tell me what the latency is in a system like this? Okay, last, um, I'm getting to the end here and I have the watchdog looking over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one focus was on engineering designing and analyzing on the design part. Given our model, we can also generate implementations and you hear for it. But what you, people are interested in is the um, qualification and assurance. This is how I got involved with Alex. He and his boss came to us and said, you know, how do you uh, go about qualifying aircraft? And because they had a hard time putting the signatures on, <laughs> it was Dr. Lewis, who at that time was at the, the head of the uh, aviation engineering directorate. And so what we then said is, well, assurance, what does it mean? Sufficient evidence that the system implementation meets its requirements. Well, the, the base, base part is obviously the stuff that we are in the middle of being involved in, architecture modeling and analysis, and the various kinds of uh, analysis techniques that you can apply before you have an implementation. But you want to complement that with two other pillars. One focuses on requirements, because if you have poor requirements and you're, requ if you're verifying against requirements, like I mentioned to you, this thing about duration, you need to do a better job with that. So we came up with a way of systematically improving the way you define requirements by doing it in the context of an architecture model. And then on the back end, uh, basically continuously support the verification process so that at the end, you effectively have an assurance case, but we do it throughout the life cycle. And uh, back at the SCI, we had a project uh, that was piloting that called architecture-led system assurance. And, uh, at JMR on short order, they were able to make use of it. And given this technology, tying back to the talk that you heard before, you now have in place an infrastructure that lets you do data-driven, high leverage and cost-effective development of software. Because now, if you continuously run these verification activities, and you're in partway through the development process and you make an architectural change or an implementation change, by running this continuously, you can immediately see what side effects are occurring, what tests fail and those kinds of things. And then you can, with this data, figure out where do you put your effort, where's the high payoff areas to improve your situation. And then this slide just shows with the numbers, there's ROI studies that uh, reduce by catching things early, we have fewer, uh, less leakage. And there was an ROI study done out of uh, um, the Savi initiative and later on uh, the JMR guys are now collecting data as well where we're getting a reduction in cost of uh, about 25% or so. And what that leads to is a development process uh, that I call double V where on the development side continues first of all because 
system integration, you're doing configuration that needs to be managed in calibration. On the other hand, we pulled the assurance part early into the process because if you're validating requirements, architecture models, and those kinds of things as well. And we can do that at each layer in a DevOps type of situation by constantly rerunning those and iteratively refining the process. So in closing, standard slide address what he stated up front. <laughs> the 70% ADL is a basis for the technology and we've had a number of pilot projects, big ones, industry-wide ones, as well as smaller ones that have shown that this is actually an interesting technology that's worthwhile taking a look at and investing in. Okay. Check it out. You're welcome. Thanks.